Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Black Doctor Talk podcast. Yes, I know you've missed us. I hope you've enjoyed your holiday break, but we are now back in full swing. And again, I am here with another amazing guest. Never do I ever disappoint you. I am Dr. Christopher Holmes, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Well, today I am joined by Dr. Brian Easley. He is the lead program coach for A Father's Place, Prince George's County, where he and his colleagues lead fathers through a 13-week evidence-based curriculum designed to strengthen their concept of self and their ability to parent their children. Dr. Easley has over, get this guys, 30 years of experience, uh, professional and leadership experience in the areas of human resource development, career development, and organizational development. Get ready, as I always say, buckle up. Now, we are literally today dropping diamonds. If you know, you know. I want you guys <laughs> to welcome Dr. Easley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, Dr. Holmes. Thank you for having me here. And greetings to all. Thank you for having me. Well, listen, I know that you have a lot to share, so we're not going to belabor this uh, conversation. I'm not even going to call it an interview. This is just a conversation. So I want you to start by telling our viewers and listeners a little bit about your background. Uh, when you think back when you were just a little bit younger, because it's not going to take that long to think back, uh, who were you before you became Dr. Uh, Easley? I want you to take us back to Harlem. Mm. Wow. Um, you know, growing up in Harlem, and I'm going to date myself, Dr. Holmes, back in the 60s and 70s, in the projects, as I, I mentioned previously, in Manhattanville projects, it, it was a great experience. I mean, times were different back then. Yes, we had a whole lot of stuff going on around us, you know, crime and, and so forth there and drugs and, you know, but back then we had um, a safety net. We had several families then, and, and that village was alive and doing well. It wasn't just, we talked about, it takes a village to raise a child. It was alive. It was, it was um, there and it was effective, Dr. Holmes. Yeah. And so I had a really rich childhood with my mom and dad and my sister growing up there. I've always been an introvert, always will be an introvert. So when I graduated from high school or prior to graduating from high school, you know, I didn't think college was for me. You know, wow. I had done well. Yeah, I had done well. I, I was in an accelerated course in college prep and all that. But my inner confidence was was just not where it, it is, let's say, today. And so I went into the Air Force. And I don't regret that. The Air Force is what sort of gave me my uh, appetite mm. for learning. And I always say of my four degrees, that associate's degree that I got, Dr. Holmes, uh, was the most meaningful one and the most important one because it said to me, I can do college work. Yeah, it was you that know? seed planter. Yes, sir. It was. It was a confidence builder, you know. Yeah. And I remember I literally I was living in Boston, Massachusetts at the time, and I cried when it came in the mail and I looked at it and I was like, wow, you know, and that gave me the foundation and the confidence to say, OK. Whatever it is, whatever is there to come, you know, you can you can do this, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but you can do this. And so uh, having uh, been in the Air Force, which was a very transformative period for me. I can remember in my late teens, early 20s, and I've always been told I was kind of an old soul growing up, even as a teenager, you know, I uh, made a pact to myself. And that pact was, one, I was never going to be a disappointment to my parents. That was very important to me, you know. That was the best way I thought I could repay them for all they had done for me. Yeah. And two, I was going to always be a credit to my race and to my people, you know. Mm -hmm and giving back. And that's always been something that's not been optional. It's been obligatory for me, you know, mm -hmm. an obligation. Yeah. And, uh, and three, I was going to do whatever I could, Dr. Holmes, to erase, diminish any negative stereotypes by my example, negative stereotypes that exist about Black men. That was very important to me, and it still is to yeah. this day there, you know. So I made that pact. I did not say at that time I was going to get my doctorate, but I did say, it, it 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 fueled me to say one I can go and get my degree as I got my associates from the community college of the Air Force and gave me the confidence to continue on. 
So tell tell me this. Let's go back to Harlem. Um, mm-hmm. You talked about this extended family network. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to say it, it was probably more like a cultural uh, awakening, um, mm. uh, an environment that honored the individuality of what you brought to the table as just not a black person, but mm. also a black man. Mm-hmm. I think that's where that whole this energy and what you're talking about now about those three things that you wanted to do. I think it stemmed this. Would you agree? I would strongly agree. At no time did anyone say in my immediate family or within my inner circle of those seven or eight families that we were really close to that you could not. Yeah. It was always the opposite. Mm-hmm. You can, mm-hmm. you know, and my f- parents friends. I remember a gentleman, Mr. Richard, I'm still, his son is my best friend, longest best friend right now, always would ask me about education. Mm -hmm. Always when he saw me, not just how you doing in school, what are you learning? What are you studying in school? Tell me something. And so he planted that seed as well as my mother and father. I can remember when my friends would come home for school, for example, in elementary, they could go out and play, you know, and my sister and I were like, why we got to, you know, we came home, we got a snack and we got right to our homework and we felt shortchanged, you know, we wanted to go out and play or watch TV, but it sent a message later on, Dr. Holmes, that still to this day, the importance of education, which I label as the true emancipator. Mm. You know, I see education once you have not just a degree, but I'm talking about lifelong learning. Yeah. You know, learning, closing gaps and what have you. And how that can free you, emancipate you, strengthen you and what have you there, you know. So it was that village. It was those individuals that gave me the confidence to say, hey, you know, you can do whatever you want. And I remember back in the day, and I think this has changed some now, but if I was labeled a goody goody, you know, growing up, you know, my mom worked in the school. She was a paraprofessional. So I'd have to be crazy if I wanted to act up or whatever. But I always wanted to please them. And but back in that day, if the the those who might have not been doing the right thing, your uh, criminals, your, mm-hmm. your pimps, your prostitutes, gang leaders, if they saw a young brother or sister that had potential, the word would get out hands off. Yeah. You know, and I had some big brothers and sisters and I know I was protected, you know, yeah. so I never got into trouble. I, You know, we did little things, you know, we smoked our weed, we drank, we did all, you know, that kind of stuff but nothing that that was serious. And I'm so grateful to this day for that village that that set that foundation for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm just listening to you talk and I, that's what you're actually doing now. You're still creating a village where people feel safe and they oh, feel yeah. protected and yeah. you're, you're feeding into them so they can go and flourish and do whatever it is that they can do. Because you're yes, not sir. saying you can't. You're saying, what, what are you going to do? Because whatever it is, you can do it. Yes, sir. That is so important. And, and as I said earlier, not to be repetitive, but for me, it's not an option. Yeah. It's an obligation. Yeah. You know? And yes, I'm part of a wonderful fraternity. But I always tell people, Dr. Holmes, I was born into an even bigger fraternity. Yeah. And that's a fraternity of Black men. Yeah. So my definition, perception, conceptualization of success has very little to do with me. You you, you rarely will hear me say, you know, degrees or whatever there, you know, uh, and not that I'm not proud of those things. But I want to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. When I say when I see that we as a people and we've had some great pockets of success, but I turn on the news every day, Dr. Holmes, and I see preteens now that are being murdered child trafficking abuse teenage pregnancy etc cetera, etc cetera. and we know we got some pockets of young people and older people that are doing great things but when i begin to see those data sets high school graduation for black men begin to grow up high school retention in college I remember I took a group of youth many years ago, another fraternity brother of ours, to um, a college tour. And there was one school, North Carolina Central, and this is back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. They said they had a ratio of 22 to 1 Black women to Black men at that time. And that always stuck with me, Dr. Holmes, 
And so I've committed myself. I'm not going to change the world, no. But along with others, when I think of success, it's not about me. It's yeah. about shifting those demographics, that data set where we can have more of our young people, older people, healthy. Yeah. Because that self-hatred did a number on us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and it's we still see it. It's an ugly little head surface yes, up sir. time to time. Yes, um, sir. And I look over your resume and I, and I see a common theme. Mm. In every degree that you ever have earned, keyword here, people earned, there is this thread of service. Mm. Every degree is a, is a degree of service, mm-hmm. giving back, of supporting. And so let's talk about the transition from the associate's degree that planted that first seed of confidence to where you decided to go and get your bachelor's and then on to get your master's. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts in psychology. And I remember faculty telling me and, and, and those in the field said, in psych, you really can't stop there. You know, you, it, it was almost at least at that time. And I think it's still kind of pertinent now where you need it. You got to get more masters at least, yeah. you know, so that seed was planted while I was a, an undergrad. And so I went to and, and then I discovered historically black colleges. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew of growing up in Harlem. I knew of Morehouse and Atlanta University Center, Dr. Holmes. I knew of Spelman. I knew of Tuskegee and the Tuskegee Airmen, et cetera, maybe half a dozen or so. But I discovered when I was doing an internship at the Higher Education Information Center, Dr. Holmes, that were there were over 100 at the time HBCUs. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. And I wish in retrospect, somebody had grabbed a hold of me early on, <laughs> put me in an upward bound program in high school or something. And I could have got a little taste of that, man, yeah. you know. And so when I discovered that, it was like, wow. And then also learning about being from Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance. Yes. And I discovered the, the creativity, the greatness, all of the wealth. And one particular person that to this day is my favorite historical figure, a gentleman by the name of Paul Robeson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when I learned about Paul Robeson and his accomplishments academically as an athlete, as a civil rights advocate, as a linguist, spoke, I've heard 13 to 36 different languages. It said to me as a young man, what is my excuse yeah. here in the 80s and 90s? Not that I, I can't sing, so I wasn't going to do all that stuff that he <laughs> did, but I can do my share. Yeah. And as I said early, success is not about me. It's about whatever I can do mm. to, to help my community. And any job, any major that I chose, any career field that I chose, um, that was important. Yeah. If I didn't see that in a position description or a vacancy announcement, I wasn't going to apply. If I didn't have that feeling at the end of the day that I made a difference, I wasn't going to apply. So that led me to Howard University. I wanted, I couldn't get it as an undergrad, but I wanted to get a little taste and they just have on my resume that HBCU. You know, I wanted to get a little part of that. And then after I got the, the, the uh, master's in education, <clears throat> I told myself, that's it. You know, I was going to stop there. Yeah. But. <laughs> you know, the education bug bit me again. And and I think what was going on, I was doing some, I think, pretty good things in the world of OD and, and HRD and career development, mm-hmm. but I didn't know why, yeah. you know? And so I wanted to kind of close some gaps. The practitioner was okay, but as far as having the conceptual knowledge as to why, yeah. When, when, when I'm doing team leading or when I'm facilitating or when I'm doing any of the training or whatever there, I wanted to close those gaps. So that led to pursuing the, the doctorate at Virginia Tech. And I wanted to get an EDD first, but I couldn't find a program that was family friendly because at the time I was um, married and I had two infant toddler children, you know. And if my wife had told me no, I was not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, uh but she gave me the blessings and the upper room if i may say gave me the blessings and that's yeah. all i needed and it took me 12 years to get that phd you wow. know 12 years my wife who is deceased now she um battled cancer four times wow. in in the 30 years beautiful 30 years that we were married 
and she beat it three times, Dr. Holmes. Wow. And the, the most challenging, she had a brain tumor and I was going through my doctoral program. So I had to step out for a while because she was my number one priority and, and my family, you know? Yeah. So, and I wasn't in a rush to get it 12 years, five years, whatever it was, you know, uh, because I didn't really need it. I did it for myself yeah. and I did it to send a message to my children and any young black children in the world that they will know at least perhaps one doctorate and not to say that you should get your doctorate, but to say that you can yeah. get your doctorate. Unfortunately, I lost my wife about two years ago to uh, stage four liver cancer. There. Wow. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. But I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, if you decide to embark on that journey, life doesn't stop lifing, so to speak. That's right. And That's so, so true. That journey, it will have its ebbs and flows. But yes, those who are committed to the process because that's what it is. It's a process. Yes, it is. And it you is, have it to is. fully embed yourself in that process in order to complete it. That's right. And uh, that's for right. those like that's you and right. I who were married and with children and decided to say, hey, I want to do this thing. It, it is a difficult, difficult thing to, number one, continue to say yes to. Yes, it is. Because yes, it is. Yes. Completion, in my opinion, is always about a succession of yeses. Mm -hmm. And when you say no, is when in the whole the road you come to the end of the road. So you right. got to keep saying yes, even if it's twelve years. That's right. That's right. I, I love That's that. Right. I love it's not. That. It's 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 not easy. And and whenever people approach me and they they're thinking about pursuing their doctorate. And I've learned, I learned a lot of things after or during while I was it, mm -hmm. going through the journey. I first want to know, what are your, what's your impetus? What is your, your ROI? What are your reasons for pursuing a doctorate? Because a lot of people believe a doctorate is a doctorate and is a, is a doctorate. You know, uh, a PhD is a PhD is a PhD. And, and you and I know that's, that's not the case. So what is your, are you looking, some people will say, and I don't judge them for this, but I just want to be called a doctor, wow. you know, or I have money uh, that I can spend from the GI bill, you know? Yeah. Um, so as opposed to, if I hear, I want to be a researcher, I want to learn how to generate grants. I want to publish. I want to uh, pursue a tenure track position. I just want them to know that there's differences, research one institutions, research two institutions and professional development yeah. not throwing shade on anyone there you know i'm I'm pleased whenever we get certificate whatever it is right. but a lot of people just don't know so i'd like to know are you looking to become a practitioner are you looking to be a scholar or what and then i can better guide you as yeah. to what type of doctorate you might want to pursue because the that one makes thing, sense the one thing i say to people is what you said but i have to tell them when you get that title especially when we get the title hmm. it comes with responsibility. Yes, it does. So what are you going to do with this new power that you possess? Because if you sit on it, that's a wasted opportunity yes, to make sir. a difference for somebody. I agree. And like you said, somebody, somebody's going to meet you to say, I met Dr. So-and-so. But when they leave you, what would they say about that encounter with you? That's right. That's right. And what is, to, just to add to your question, if I may, what is your bigger legacy? Yeah. And so if, if if you go to the grave or you go to the upper room <clears throat> and it's all about, well, I had these three letters behind my name and I, 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 okay. Um, okay. Uh, but I think I'll speak for myself. I'm more impressed. To see, like you said, what did you do with that yeah. privilege? What did you do with what you earned with that knowledge? People say knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. That's only a small percentage of that of the of the of the entity. It's the being thirsty for knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's the acquisition of knowledge. How do you get, secure it? How do you gain it? How are you going to apply mm -hmm. that knowledge? And here's the big one, Doctor Holmes. How are you going to go about sharing? It yes. With with others, are you going to be a knowledge hoarder? And we got a lot of them out there. Oh, yeah. You know, for whatever reason, insecurities or whatever. But, hey, that's where the real beauty is. And also the creation of knowledge. 
Yes. Can you add to that body of, of literature or to that expertise? Yeah. Yeah. I always think about it. Uh, I'm a former high school science teacher. So I, when I when I take that same analogy, you said knowledge is potential power. Yes. But it only becomes uh, valuable when that knowledge is activated. That's right. That's right. And again, us as black folk, share it. Share it. Share it. You know, to whoever, whoever wants to receive it, you, you know, and you listen and you gain some from them. I don't care who it is. Third grade dropout. You can learn something from someone there. Yes. Yes. Yeah, most definitely. Most mm. definitely. Guys, I hope you're picking up these nuggets. I hope you're picking them up. He's he's dropping them. He's dropping them. I, I do want to shift into uh, your work with the Department of uh, Transportation because you did that for so long. And I specifically want to focus on uh, your role as Chief Learning Officer and Diversity Officer. Uh, what did you bring to the table in that position? Uh, and when you walked away from it, what were you most proud of? Um. I think I'll start with the latter. What I was most proud of, I think, is that I always wanted my my dissertation focused on developmental support networks, which is the nuanced term for mentoring, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I always wanted I was at Department of Treasury prior to transportation and I was a training officer there and I wanted to start a mentoring program for the bureau that I was part of and never did it for whatever reason there you know i would do proposals i would try to fight for it and it never happened i got to dot and i did the same thing i was trying to say we need and then and then, then it's funny how things happen and i don't care how they happen as long as they do <laughs> right <laughs> i think it was a, a women's history month program and a young sister stood up and asked and my superior supervisors were in the audience asked do we have a mentoring program here at department of transportation so then all of a sudden, <laughs> as soon as I got upstairs, my uh, chain of command, Brian, we need to start a mentoring program. We need to start <laughs> a mentoring program. So, you know, that's that's what I'm most proud of, that we yeah. were able to start a de department wide mentor mentorship for folks, because I believe in the power of mentoring. It's something mm -hmm. personal. When I came into my doctoral program, I believed at the time when I was applying, I was going to write my dissertation was going to focus on mentorship. But I went, as many of us do, in different areas there. You know, there were other things, but I eventually came back home yeah. to, to, to that mentorship. Um, and so that's what I'm most, most proud of. The first part of your question, please, I'm sorry. Uh, well, you, you did so many things there, right? You yeah. workforce analysis, workforce planning, recruitment, diversity and inclusion, leadership and, and workplace development. Like, how did you harness all of that to have a clear focus uh, in, in all of those areas that you felt like were going to be effective? I had an awesome team. I, I, I always give them credit there. It was, it was a small team. And it still amazes me the things that we did uh, with just about six of us there, wow. you know? And, but they were high level. In the government, I was a GS-15. They were 14s. I had one GS-13. So they were college educated, bright, smart, and they made me look better. Than, than what I actually was. I always give them props there. But we were able to uh, um, focus in. One of the biggest frustrations, though, was with the DNI, diversity and inclusion. This is toward the latter part of my stint when um, there was a certain administration that was on board at the time. And I don't know how many people knew this, but DNI was not diversity and inclusion and equity were not uh, comfortable terms at that wow. time. You yeah, know, sure. and a matter of fact, there was a witch hunt, Dr. Holmes. We were told that we had to um, present and share. We had to stop. We cease and desist any kind of DNI training. Stop. And then we had to share whatever DNI training we had done and any other training we were going to do for the next fiscal year. So that was extremely frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start a diversity and inclusion council, which DOT had had at one time. And I was told no. Mm, okay. So what we did is we formed an employee resource group consortium. We took the, we asked the leaders within DOT to become part of this. We called it an ERG uh, a consortium. And we would meet quarterly. And the purpose of that entity was to help those leaders 
to identify resources. We surveyed them. We asked them what they were looking for, what would help them. Uh, how do you go about recruiting folks for your ERGs, retaining individuals, securing space, you know, uh, and I'm proud that we were able to to have a successful stint. I was told now they do have a DNI council, and I'm very grateful of that yeah. um, because that's 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 needed. That's much needed there. And it's interesting that you say that because I get a lot of people uh, that I interview that are engaged in that work. But you're the first person that I had an opportunity to talk about that work during a certain uh, administration of this country where we know that type of language was not tolerated. Yes. It was. It was all it was condemned, not almost condemned. It was condemned. It was um, horrible. And so I, I'm sure at that time you felt uh, like your work was being stalled just a little bit because it's not what you really wanted to do. It, it was frustrating because uh, and I hope I'm not jumping the gun. I, I saw one of your other questions about DNI. Yeah. And, and, and DNI goes way beyond just race and color and, and those five basic entities there. It's diversity of thought. It's cultural diversity. It, it basically means not being fearful of someone or group who are different than yeah. you are, yeah. you know? And I've always been one where, man, I love to travel, you know, uh, not so much to get away, but especially to other regions of the world where I can learn about their language, their practices, their belief system, their, their, you know, whatever, recreational activities, you know, that's enriching. And I wish I could, you know, just create some kind of pill and people could take it <laughs> and, and, and one, realize the breadth of diversity, yeah. you know, and not just look at race. I think too many yeah. of us look at race and color and ethnicity and that's it, you know, but just difference and that that pill that they take would not make them fearful Mm -hmm. of the difference, but maybe a little curious. Yeah. What can I learn? Not to judge, not not to say your way is better than mine, the way you believe, the way you pray is better than what I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but respecting, respecting one another. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to decide to practice it, but at least maybe open up your mind a little bit yeah. and 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 try to maybe comprehend and understand and maybe find some value. Yeah. And I think the key word you just said there towards the end was open. Just be open. Yes. Because yes. openness is what's going to create those experiences that will cause you to learn. That's right. That's right. That's right. I, I, I had on my team the uh, first time I, I ever uh, supervised or managed the work of someone who was was deaf. And it was very eye opening, you know. I learned a little bit of, of sign language. I learned about the deaf culture, you know, and it, it was, it was really, it was really awesome, you know? So it, like you said, and, and as we're reinforcing, if you just open your mind and, and realize, I think Americans, not to stereotype all Americans, but we're so nationalistic, many of us, Yeah, you know, we, we can go to somebody else's country and, and demand they learn English. Right. You no, know, you know, <laughs> you know, that's arrogance. That's that's yeah. you know, something's wrong with that picture. Yeah. There. You know, you're in their country. So instead of you saying, let me learn Spanish or French or whatever the language is, you know, Swahili, they have to accommodate me. Yeah. 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 Mm. I want to um ask you this question. Mm -hmm. While in your doctorate program, and considering all the things you had gone through during that time. What did completion feel like for you? Oh, man, Dr. Holmes, emancipation is the mm. first word that comes to mind, because, you know, most of us and I've had many talks with those who have gone through the journey, especially you, you get to the dissertation phase and emancipation in that I could go out to a movie with my <laughs> wife. You know where I'm going. And I could sit there and I could be checked in 100 percent in that movie or read a book. And, and so forth, or playing with my kids, and I'm 100% checked in yeah. once I'm done. Yeah. Prior to that, maybe 80% of me was 75%, but the other 20, 25% is, man, I got to work on this. I got to review yep. this paper. I got to write this. I got to, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's challenging. And I talked to many people also who have said, and I know I said this at some point, and I think you alluded to this earlier, at some point, I said, man, is this worth it? Yeah. 
you know, and I thought about, you know, stopping out because it was, it was, it can, it's very stressful. And that's why I always say to people, if you want to do it, you got to do it for the right reasons there. Yeah. You know, but I know one thing that scared me as I was applying, I saw some data. I don't remember the source, but I saw data that said doctoral students had a high degree of uh, divorce, you know, going through the journey. Yeah. And that scared me. I said, man, I talked to my wife about it. I talked to God. I said, no, I it, I don't want it that bad. I don't want it that bad, you know. So I had to try to I tried to find a program where I could balance as best as possible that was family friendly, you know, right. and I, I I did find that at Virginia Tech, but I wasn't that. And that's another reason it took 12 years. I was I was in no rush, yeah. you know, but I knew I was going to get there because the other thing that was driving me and was that there's a term in baseball called hitting for the cycle. Mm -hmm. So and this might have been a bit of e ego or whatever, but I said, well, I got the associate, I got the bachelor's, I got the master's. And this was on low on the list. Let me just go ahead and get the doctorate. Yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah. I think uh, I love when you say the word uh, emancipation. Yeah. Because yeah. in essence, the, the, this program, when you're in it, you are bound, literally. Yes, yes. And I, yes. I, mean, I laugh when you said the movies because it didn't matter where I went. There was either my phone or my laptop with me every place I went to. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 I couldn't get away from it. Yes, yes. You're not plugged in. You're not checked in 100%. And it's not fair to your family. And that's why I tell people who are married or have children, they got to come along with you. Yeah. You know, and very few people I find, God bless them, unless you've gone through the journey. And this is not a put down or throwing shade. You can empathize to a certain degree, but you really don't know yeah. what it's like, you know. And and so, yeah, I might be at a party or something, but I'm thinking, oh, man, I got to get home and work on this paper and, and this chapter, <laughs> and, yeah. and I, the defense and, you know, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, it all shuts down. I'm telling that's you, it. that's it. it. That's down. it. So it was so freeing and emancipating when I was done. I could breathe. I could smell the roses. I could, you know, I was checked back in with life. That's what I, how I found. So you you graduate, you retire. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk to us now about how did you get into a father's place and tell us what that is. Uh, father's place, as, as you mentioned earlier, is a program designed for fathers in Prince George's County, Maryland. And it's designed for fathers who are 18 years and older, who have children who are 18 years of age and older and younger and younger, mm -hmm. excuse me. And they have to be residents of the county. Those are the only three criteria. And so it's been around for about two or three years, but because of COVID and some other administrative things, it was put to rest for a while. And thanks to a woman named Patricia Strong, it's been revitalized. And now serving as the lead program coach, we've got about, we started off with about 10 individuals about three weeks ago. We just completed our first three week, uh, thir our third week, excuse me. And it's designed for 13 weeks. And what we focus on is a plethora of things. One is helping them to learn more about themselves mm. as as individuals there. So we have assessments like we have a parenting inventory that they take and they're about to get those results in a few weeks to identify what they're doing well in. We want to make sure we recognize that as, as parents, their strengths, but also their areas of improvement and how we can begin to close those gaps there. And so we are helping them to maneuver the system, if you will. We have some wonderful partners that we're working with to help us with the court system, mental health services there. Um, and we meet with them twice a week, Dr. Holmes, wow. uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings for two and a half hours. And we have individual coaching that we give to them. Um, we also will be having them take the DISC assessment there to find out more about their behavior style and personality style as well. And so it's the first few weeks are focused on getting to know them. And it can be a painful journey for some because like we talked about forgiveness, mm. you know, the other night and the importance of forgiveness, forgiving yourself. Yes. Many of these young brothers, older brothers, I think we got ages in this cohort, we've got 20 early 20s to early four, mid 40s i think and mm. so many of them have been beat up sometimes by their own families you know and your own grandfather in one case 
uh, brother said his own grandfather said he wasn't going to be any good. Wow. Fathers that just ignored them, their biological fathers that were, and some that were in the house with them and they were like invisible to them. So there's a lot of pain and trauma mm -hmm. and stuff and they have to, and we're not a therapeutic entity, no, but we have resources for that if needed. So right. we're not trying to fix that per se, but if we become aware of that, we do make referrals to them. Mm -hmm. And we're helping them to understand what healthy manhood is. And that's a space I've been in for the past or trying to still be in for the past 10 years. Yeah. Another wonderful nonprofit group called A Call to Men uh, was established in um, New York City by two African-American men, Ted Bunch and Tony Porter. And Ted and Tony are still trying to help men to understand healthy manhood. Yeah. You know, to hopefully reduce um, divorce rates, hopefully, hopefully to uh, reduce um, um, domestic violence there. Um, because we got a lot of men out here that their emotional IQs are very narrow. And I know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The one emotion that many men are being given license to share with the world is anger. Yeah. But when it comes to depression or sadness or any other type of emotion, often they are emasculated. Often they are told they're less of a man. Often they are demeaned or ridiculed, you know, if they express. So we're trying to help these men to become better men and then to talk about co-parenting, to work with on behalf of their children, no yeah. matter what happened in your marriage or between you and your significant other, to be able to, in the best way possible, co-parent with this individual for the sake of the children. And we also, third, talk about their relationship with their child. And we try to connect some dots as they think about, like the other night we did an exercise on the child within. Mm. You know, going back to, what were some of the needs that you had as a child? Were those needs met or were they not met? And if you were a parent and you were a visioning exercise, dealing with someone, a child with those same needs, what would you do? How yeah. would you address it? You know, so we're helping them to become better men, better co-parents, and hopefully better dads to, to their children. Wow. Uh, can, can you sign up for a second 13-week if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine the amount of unpacking that has to happen yeah. in that oh, program. Man. And then depending on the extent of trauma. Yes. You know, yes. you need some additional time. Oh, um, yes. Yes. We can talk about this all day. I, I mentor myself. You're, you're spot I mentor, on. I mentor younger boys, younger Thank men. Thank you. Thank and, you. I've Thank been you. doing it since I was a high school teacher. So I've been doing it for a very, very long time. Thank you, my brother. Um, Thank you. I appreciate you. And I'm like you, I understand how important it is to be to be a willing example and model yes, for sir. somebody else. Yes, sir. Because yes, sir. I, I am that young man. I didn't have a, an active father in my life. Mm, mm. Um, but this is what I, I tell I tell young men now. And then I promise we'll continue. I had to come to terms with who my father was. Mm. I had to stop expecting him to be the dad I wanted him to be and uh -huh. accept him for what it was he could bring to the table and just love that part of him. Yes, sir. Because he was there never go. going to be the dad I needed him to be. Why? Right. He didn't have the capacity. Right. He didn't receive that father in his life. So he That's gave right. me the best version of himself and That's I right. to love him. Yes. And you forgive him. I you forgive, forgive him. him, not for him, but for Dr. Holmes. That's right. So that you can continue to be your best self and you're yes. so spot on. You're so spot on. And so many of uh, that, that little boy within is still prevalent in many 50, 60, 70 year old. It just doesn't go away. One of the brothers in the program, his mother said, just get over it. His own mama told him, just, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. That's yeah. pain. That's in first thing you got to do is acknowledge it. Yeah. I mean, that hurts. Your own dad is not, you know, involved for whatever reason. And it's not just, you can have a dad in the household. He can be physically there, but emotionally unavailable, intellectually unavailable, physically unavailable, et cetera, et cetera. There, you know, 
And so, and I, and, and I, I, I toss my hat, I, I, I commend folks like you, despite, despite that adversity, despite your dad not doing what you have accomplished, however you managed yeah. that. And we know it's not easy. We yeah. know it's not easy because we yearn for that. We yearn for that. But kudos to you because there are many who go in another direction, yeah. if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. And they're in the penal system and they're dead or or not healthy or whatever there. So kudos to you, my brother. Yeah. And I think what you said is this. It goes back to having a village. And if yes. you don't have one, learn how to find one and create one. There you go. Finding an inner circle. We talked about that also. They're doing an exercise for next Tuesday and looking at uh, what are their intellectual social, emotional, creative, physical needs. And so as they look at their social needs, we want them to look at your inner circle. Yeah. What kind of people are you hanging out with? Mm -hmm. What kind of energy are they bringing to you? You know, and there are some times, and, and, and I've always said to, to folks, friendship is a dear entity. Mm -hmm. However, I think Facebook has made friendship more of a commodity and you just hit a button and some yeah. people think that you're a friend. No, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, there are many people that will be with you on the mountaintop when yeah. things are good. Life is great. Money's flowing. Everybody's working and we're partying. Hey, who? But when you're down in that valley, when things are tough, things are rough, man, not all the people on that mountaintop are going to be in that valley with you. But yeah. those who are with you, perhaps, perhaps with time, you may say that's a friend. Yeah. You may say that's a friend, but it doesn't come as easy as hitting the button on Facebook or whatever other tools they got out there. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to get off of that because we can stay there for the next two hours. All um, right, my brother. All right. I wanna, yeah. I want to ask you this because, you know, even that work itself is valuable work. So with all the things that you've done and the things that you're currently doing, what is going to be your legacy? You know, I don't say this this often, Dr. Holmes, but I, uh, like I said, to my last breath, you know, mentoring, coaching, training, listening to, being available to particularly uh, Black folk, particularly Black men, you know, with my, my son and my daughter as well to help them to be productive, constructive members. They're young adults right now, and I'm extremely proud of them. But I'm hoping, I, I can say, not to brag or boast, because that's not me, but I have worked with thousands of individuals at this time. I hope God will give me a chance to work with a thousand more. And I hope to find brothers like you that, that value and understand this obligatory process. This, again, is not something that's optional. You know, I, I look at, I'm motivated. I know what self-hatred is doing and has done to us. Just because Lincoln signed the document, God bless him, in 1864 or 63, whatever it was, the pain doesn't go away. Yeah. The trauma doesn't go away. And you tell one person, you feed him with negative, negative, negative. You're ugly. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're not smart. You're property. You're not even a human being. You're property. What does that do to them? The signing of that document does not make that go away. Yeah. And it gets passed on and passed on for generations. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the alpha, the omega, the, 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 the crux of what we are, are fighting right now, you know? And then you got major distractions like materialism, hedonism, and, in, and not individualism, but uh, narcissism yeah. and uh, uh, egocentrism that I think are being fed off. Cause when you got that self-hatred, you're trying to find your identity. So you find it in things and yes. clothes that you wear and all that, but that's a false narrative. So I'm committed. My legacy, go back to your question. Hopefully whatever I can do, I'm not going to change the world by myself. I need more folks to, to, for us to work together and understand what true success is. It ain't about you. Yep. It ain't about me walking around talking about, I got four degrees. Who cares? So what? Whose life have you changed? And I would say lives. Lives, yes. Plural, if I may, my brother. Yeah. Lives. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Dr. Holmes. Yeah. Did I answer your question? 
Your brother, you answered that question. <laughs> All right. Oh man, uh, I, I'm enjoying this conversation. Um, as we as get we come to a uh, uh, close, I do want to ask you this one final question, and, and this is important uh, for those that are listening and viewing because you are a member of the Black Doctor uh, Network. We are privileged to have individuals uh, like you be a part of this organization. So, talk a little bit about what the Black Doctoral Network means to you. Oh man, one, it, it, like I said. The journey is so lonely. <laughs> yes. And so, and this is not, again, I'm going to say again, not to condescend to others, but when you can talk to others about that journey, it's, 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 it's powerful. I don't know what the data says now, but African-American PhDs make up, I think it's less than 1%. Please check me if I'm wrong, yeah. but it's very minuscule. So it's very few that have a PhD few that have a doctorate, et cetera, there. So it's, it's, it's a nice, wonderful fraternity. The podcast, I was just listening to one, I think her name was Dr. Cromer, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, uh, that you yeah. interviewed. And it was insightful as I listened to her talk about her journey and her sharing, you know? And so again, that's what success is. If we can share with one another, and I think the Black Doctoral Network, I know, excuse me, let me correct myself. I know the Black Doctoral Network does that there. And just saying to others who are thinking about taking that journey, it's possible. Awesome. It ain't going to be easy. Will not be easy. OK, but it is possible. And you can get some mentoring. You can get some support. You can get some encouragement. You should get some information. You can have someone to listen to you if you're considering it, if you're going through that that journey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the things she said in that interview, which I think you exemplify uh, even in this interview, is about representation. Mm. Don't mm -hmm. just be in the number. Let that number count for something. Ah, amen, my brother. Yes, sir, Dr. Holmes. That's right. Uh, or, 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 or what? what is, you know, I think about people that are laying, God forbid, knock on wood on their deathbed. And, and if your thoughts are about the kind of home you lived in or how much the kind of car you drove or you wore, uh, Imani suits. I don't know what kind of, you know, um, I feel for you. Yeah. I can't judge you. That's up to the upper room. I do not judge other human beings. or I try not to, but I'm saying if that's what you think your legacy is going to be, nobody's going to remember that. Yeah. How did you impact your children? How did you impact your family? How did you impact your community? Yeah. You know, you didn't have to change the world, but I believe you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's no fence that you can straddle. It's one or the other. Yeah. You know, in the psalmist, they, they wrote, you no, know, you build your hopes on things eternal. Yes, sir. Things that are going to last. Yes, things sir. Be generational. Yeah. Uh, you're going to start preaching, Dr. Holmes. Yeah. And, and right, those, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's where we want to plan our focus. Those mm. things that are eternally good. For other people yes. and, and yes. that's what the power of these of this degree of the effort the energy the work that we put in that's where it makes a difference yes and that sir. way you don't yes, have to worry sir. about that dash the dash yes. fills in on its own there you go and we got so much potential out here that is just being wasted yeah for whatever reason yeah. You know, it's not being actualized we got some people saying out here that education is not important you know, and we will, there was a time, I, I love sports, you know, football, basketball, what have you there. But it was a time when you use those talents to get your degree, let's say. Yes. And I can remember watching back in the 70s, 80s, a basketball game, and you would hear about what the brother's major was, or mm -hmm. maybe what the GPA was, or academic uh, a scholar, uh, et cetera. Now, at least when I watch it, they're just athletes. That's it. Yeah. You know, and if you look up some of these graduation rates for some, I mean, you know, I, I like to look at them when the NCA March Madness stuff comes around, you know, but that comes from whoever's at home, I think, with that child. I don't care if it's the next LeBron, Michael, whoever there, you know, Jim Brown, whatever. Um, prioritize. Yeah. prioritize because you can only run or shoot that ball for a short period of time 
you get injured, you you get uh, put off the team, whatever. And we got so many brothers who are back on the corner. Yes. Whether it's Harlem, whether it's Atlanta, whether, wherever, Watts, you know. And they were going to be the next. Mm -hmm. They were going to be the next, you know. OK. I remember hearing a story about if I can. Well, there was some school in the South here that had football players that were reading, I think, at an elementary school level. And they had these young men reading Dr. Seuss books. They were under their beds in their dormitory. Yeah. And I don't look at the young men with that travesty, Dr. Holmes. I look at whoever's at home, whoever that caretaker was. When you discovered little Brian or little Christopher were reading, they're in, in seventh grade, they're reading at a fifth grade level. Oh, never mind sports. Yeah. You no, know, we got we got to work on this because reading math are not just their life skills. Yes. Not just academic skills. You can't yeah. read. You make it to the pros. You can't read that contract. Mm -hmm. So you're reliant upon somebody else. You know, so yeah. I can yeah. think I kind of digress there. No, no, there, you're, Dr. you're absolutely right, because yeah. you know, it's about prioritizing those things that make the biggest difference. Right. Yes. Because. What happens when the injury occurs or what happens when the celebration and the applause end? And Thank that's you. one of the issues that many of our young men are having. They're being yes. celebrated for their athletic prowess, yes. but not being celebrated for the achievement in their in in intellectual abilities. Thank you. And, and we got similar things going on with our sisters, too. Most definitely. You know, they are in many cases being demeaned and not being celebrated for their, their intellect. You know, yeah. I, I, I love, um, and I always think of the, the, the name of the movie, the movie um, with the sisters who were at NASA. Help me here, Dr. Holmes. Um, um, uh, Hidden Figures, Hidden Figures, yes, Hidden Figures, it. yeah. And I love, when I saw, I think it was Taraji Henson, all three of them, you know, Octavia, Taraji, and, and, and Janelle. When uh, she got up on that board, man, and she was working <laughs> that math problem. You remember that scene? I remember. You know, oh man, brilliant. And you had white men sitting there, you know, watching her, and she was working that that thing. I'm like, mm, mm. why can't that's sexy? Yeah, yeah, that's sexy. Why yeah. can't we? Well, I know why. It's a rhetorical question. Why are we not promoting that without yeah. black women? I watch. Well, I don't watch them, but on if I may say so, on a certain network, um, I'm going to say it, Oprah's network, OWN. There's these so-called reality shows. And I look and I see Black women, and I think of my mother and my grandmother, my aunts, my uh, women, uh, that, that, that are, are behaving in a way that often is immature and, and they're cursing at each other and throwing drinks on each other. And, and you know, but a lot of this is by design. Yeah. It's part of the master plan. You yeah. know what I'm talking about. But what you're what you're saying is important because the money shouldn't be the priority. Yes, we have to have it. It it does allow things to happen. Yes. But if you have yes. to degrade yourself and others to make it, that's not that's not the kind of dollar you need to be making. I'm in strong agreement with you, Dr. Holmes, strong agreement, but it's the Nielsen ratings. I get it. You're right. It's the money that's flowing. Yep. But I, what's more important, I think you and I believe when you wake up in the morning, can you look at yourself in the mirror? Yeah. Yeah. And be well, okay with what you see. Yeah. Well, Dr. Easley, this has been uh, a tremendous experience. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to sit and have a conversation with me. Um, I want you to uh, share with the viewers and listeners where they can go to learn more about the work that you're doing. You can probably the best place, Dr. Holmes, is on LinkedIn. You can find me, Brian uh, Easley, PhD, on uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, you can also communicate with me through my email, uh, biggienyc at verizon.net. Listen, guys. But Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you for having me. And thank no you for the BDN. Guys, go follow Dr. Easley right now. Connect with him. And while you're connecting with Dr. Easley, guess what? If you just have a few extra minutes, we would love for you to go and connect with the Black Doctoral Network as well. We would love to exchange information, yes. share knowledge, and yes. share experiences 
with you. Thank That's you guys so much about. for joining us today here on the Black Doctor Talk podcast. We hope that you will join us next time. But until then, be safe, be blessed, and we'll see you on the next go around. Peace.